Good afternoon, everybody. Pleasure of mine joining this event. I'm Petros Ostrovichus. I'm a member of European Parliament uh, elected in uh, Lithuania. I belong to Renew Europe group, Liberals Democrats of Europe in this group. And I thank you, all of you, for joining uh, our today's discussion titled Addressing Human Rights Abuses in Kazakhstan, a need for a the EU response. Pleasure of mine to announce that this event is organized in cooperation with uh, the Open Dialogue Foundation. And this discussion is a follow-up action to the European Parliament resolution of uh, 11 of February this year on the human rights situation in Kazakhstan. The aim is to look into the human rights situation in Kazakhstan assist the civil society and engage the Kazakhstan authorities into an open and frank dialogue. I'm very happy that we have a balanced composition of very good speakers uh, for today's uh, discussion. Kazakh human rights defenders, a journalist who has been covering recent parliamentary elections in Kazakhstan, a scholar devoted to a Central Asia region and, of course, the European Union Special Representative for Central Asia, Ambassador Peter Burian. I look forward, dear colleagues, to hearing your suggestions on how the European Union should act in order to assist Kazakhstan implement its international commitments and human rights obligations, which are also set out in, a, in the enhanced partnership and cooperation agreement with the European Union. Allow me to highlight a couple of issues uh, that, in my opinion, should be a priority in building lasting relations between the European Union and Kazakhstan. I will start from free and fair elections, which is a basis for any democratic society. The OEC or DEARS limited election observation mission has indicated numerous shortcomings in the January 2021 parliamentary election in Kazakhstan, including a subdued political campaign that prevented voters from making an informed individual choice. In the European Parliament resolution, we noted that the opposition Democratic Party was prevented from registration and participation in the election. Moreover, two, oppo uh, two opposition movements, the Koshe Partiasi and the Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan were labeled as extremist organizations and banned from any campaigning and election. Their members and supporters dominate the list of political prisoners. At the time when the European Parliament resolution was adopted, there were 28 political prisoners in Kazakhstan, 19 persons convicted in politically motivated criminal cases, 96 persons persecuted for political reasons. Also, last year, five op uh, opposition activists were killed or died in very unclear circumstances. I would be very interested to hear if there have been any changes, I hope for better, in these numbers lately. Here, at the European Parliament, we are alerted and deeply concerned about the shrinking space for civil society in Kazakhstan. Our resolution was triggered by the attack against the human rights organizations, which were heavily fined and ordered to suspend their activities. One of our speakers represents the targeted human rights organizations and will tell us more about it. I will just add that persecution and criminal cases against the human rights, rights of organizations and human rights defenders must come to the end and those arrested should be released immediately and unconditionally. Another worrying trend in Kazakhstan is an attack on media freedom and freedom of speech. It is intolerable that journalists are being harassed, physically attacked, 
and detained while executing their professional duties such as exposing corruption, use of torture in the Kazakh penitentiary system, and covering the critical to the government protests. Disappointingly, in 2020, Kazakh authorities brought more than 38 criminal cases against journalists for alleged crimes such as spreading false information and incitement. More worrisome is that the state control over the freedom of speech is modernizing and moves online space seeking to censor and control internet. Most recently, I was really surprised on introduction of kind of the, uh, <laughs> I probably would call it uh, as, a, as a head of, uh, or a master who would, uh, uh, lead journalists through the, uh, their work of coverage and uh, press conferences. This is something, a new invention by the Kazakh authorities, which to my mind is really impressive. The last point I want to focus upon is the widespread corruption among the ruling elites. Kazakhstan ranks 94th in the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index. There is a direct link between corruption and violation of human rights, as the Kazakh people are being deprived from their basic rights as citizens, including quality of public services, social justice, and socio-economic development of the country. The European Union seeks for cooperation with Kazakhstan. The Enhanced Partnership and Cooperation Agreement is a proof of that. The European Union is Kazakhstan's biggest trade partner. However, it should be known that we put respect for human rights and democracy above economic gains. I am well aware about the political reforms initiated by the President Tokai. I welcome these efforts, in particular, the intention to strengthen the Office of Commissioner for Human Rights. The President and Kazakh government present Kazakhstan as a listening state. For this purpose, the National Council of Public Trust was launched to provide a direct channel of communication between the government and civil society. I truly wish the Kazakh authorities to live up to their promises as soon as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that uh, this discussion will encourage an open and frank dialogue between the civil society and authorities in Kazakhstan and will lead towards improving the human rights situation in the country. Thank you very much. And I handle my uh, or all responsibilities to uh, Ludmila Kozlovska, who will moderate our today's discussion. Ludmila, pleasure of mine. Thank you so much, Petras. Really appreciate your support, especially for civil society, which is far away in Kazakhstan, because, you know, it's the only opportunity for civil society's voice to be heard. And especially with members of European Parliament and both with EU diplomats and broader audience. And especially it's important because just um, a few weeks ago, we had a quite worrying uh, news that President Takayev on 5th of March signed a law allowing international treaties to be suspended. And I think today's discussion with such distinguished guests would allow us to understand the risk, what could follow afterwards, and uh, what uh, will be with implementation of international obligation from the side of the Kazakhstani authorities. And I'm not going to introduce everyone just now. I'm going to introduce step by step, so we just save our time, and our speakers will be able uh, to deliver their messages to the audience. But I would like just to say that we are really appreciate uh, support of your and other members of European Parliament, which allow us to, to, to bring these messages uh, to, to the public. So first, my question and introduction will be about um, and will be given to the uh, EU diplomats. Uh, so Ambassador Peter Burian, EU Special Representative of, for Central Asia. Dear Ambassador, I'm really glad to see you uh, with us. And uh, your mandate, I will just shortly introduce to uh, our viewers, uh, your mandate includes promoting EU political coordination in Central Asia, monitoring the implementation of the EU Central Asia strategy, and supporting regional security in the region. 
Could you please evaluate briefly on what extent Kazakhstan is in line with its international obligations based on EU Central Asia strategy and the enhanced partnership and cooperation agreement in the light of recent development mentioned in the resolution of European Parliament? Floor is yours. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, I, I hear you perfectly. Okay, please. Great. So, first of all, good afternoon to everybody. And uh, Ludmila, thank you for introducing me. And uh, I also would like to thank Mr. Austrevich uh, to invite me uh, to attend this timely and important uh, discussion. We very much appreciate the attention of members of the European Parliament to uh, the human rights situation in EU partner countries. And let me use this opportunity and also respond to your question and briefly share a couple of points on how I see the engagement of the European Union on these matters with Central Asian countries, including Kazakhstan, since, as you mentioned, my portfolio is more regional than bilateral. But of course, I very much pay attention during my visits and engagement to issues of uh, human rights situation of uh, civil society, because I believe these are very important partners and issues for our engagement and for building uh, and strengthening stability in the region. And uh, as you know, the EU and uh, its external action service has a strong determination to stand up for human rights around the world. The commitment has also been reflected in the European Union strategy on Central Asia as one of the key elements for strengthening partnership for resilience and prosperity with Central Asian countries. These are two key priorities along with support for regional uh, cooperation as factor of stability. And we believe respect for human rights, rule of law, uh, basic freedoms and adherence to international commitments and standards in this area are really key for uh, sustainable development, stability and prosperity of Central Asia and any country uh, around the world. Um, that is why we pay a lot of attention to these issues in bilateral and inter-regional dialogues also and mechanisms of cooperation. And for us, really, Kazakhstan is a very important partner in Central Asia. The country has achieved a lot during 30 years of independence, but I believe even more needs to be done for Kazakhstan to achieve its ambitious goals, including a goal which, of course, is very ambitious to become one of the most prosperous countries in the world uh, globally. And I think when uh, things are done correctly, um, I think uh, it's, it's not excluded. Uh, on the contrary, it might be achieved. But we believe that really uh, focusing in the development on all three pillars, security, economic development, and human rights is very important to move this process of reform and uh, modernization. And in this respect, we support Kazakhstan uh, reform and modernization processes, including Kazakhstan's third stage of political reform aimed at the democratization of society announced by president quite recently. Having said that, uh, recently we also had to react in our dialogue, but also through public statements to some problematic developments in relation to respect for freedom of association, assembly and expression, uh, which continue to, uh, we believe, restrict the political landscape and had also negative impact on recent elections. We mentioned it in our statement following the uh, elections and uh, supporting the conclusions of ODIR monitoring mission. We also have raised the, the issue of treatment of several NGOs and human rights activities in our statement from 1st February. And issues of human rights continue to be high on our bilateral agenda, including regular dialogue on human rights. And we really welcome open and constructive exchanges that took place during the EU-Kazakhstan Human Rights Dialogue and the Justice and Home Affairs Subcommittee, uh, which were held uh, at the end of November last year. And among other things, we have encouraged our partners to address obstacles to freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and association and other outstanding issues mentioned also 
once again in the recent resolution of the European Parliament mentioned by uh, Mr. Austrevicius. We have also stressed the importance of the independence and pluralism of the media and also importance of a thriving civil society as a partner for the government in those reform processes. And as a firm supporter of Kazakhstan, including reform process, which aims at furthering the country's modernization, democracy and stability, we are ready to continue working with the government as well as with civil society and help addressing these issues through training, capacity building and sharing best practices utilizing bilateral and regional programs and instruments, including a uh, recently uh, launched program, Rule of Law in Central Asia. Actually, it was launched in, uh, in Nur Sultan in uh, uh, November uh, 2019. And we believe that above all, it is in the interest of Kazakhstan, its people to address those issues without delay to fully unleash the potential of the country economically, politically and socially. I very much appreciate the expertise of a vibrant civil society in Kazakhstan, including Kazakhstan's International Bureau for Human Rights and Rule of Law, which uh, is represented in our discussion by its director, Yevgeny Shotis and his other colleagues whom I, uh, I meet on my visits and events quite regularly. And we discuss really very openly those issues. And uh, also I uh, very much appreciate their, their work. And uh, we believe that their work, the work of civil society, NGOs, human rights defenders, provides crucial direct support for the president's and government reform agenda. Such, such action if, uh, as, uh, as uh, we were witnessing recently of law enforcement and other authorities, however, um, uh, not only hinder these reform efforts, but also fulfillment of ambitious goals and objectives of Kazakhstan, I mentioned in the beginning. Once again, I wish to reiterate that the EU believes that the transition taking place in Kazakhstan, but also uh, post-COVID-19 crisis recovery offers an important opportunity to build back better, to do things differently, strengthening political reforms and uh, the promotion and protection of human rights. And once again, I wanted to reiterate the commitment and uh, uh, say that EU stands ready to work with Kazakhstan to advance this important agenda fully in line with the Enhanced Partnership and Cooperation uh, uh, Agreement mentioned also by Mr. Austrovicius, which entered into force almost exactly a year ago. And Kazakhstan was the first country actually to sign. And also there was a very uh, kind of speedy ratification uh, process. So it's also uh, showing that uh, parliaments of our member states are uh, really looking with um, uh, certain expectations, but also uh, certain appreciation of uh, the potential in the country to really be uh, democratic, prosperous and, and stable when addressing those issues we uh, mentioned uh, in the beginning. Finally, I uh, appreciate the invitation of Kazakhstan to host third EU Central Asia Civil Society Forum this autumn, where we'll be discussing how to better use and further involve potential of civil society uh, of the whole region of all five countries. And of course, situation in every country is different. So we want to uh, fully uh, involve uh, civil society and we already started it uh, in Bishkek two years ago into implementation of the EU strategy on Central Asia, as well as a sustainable green recovery uh, from COVID-19 crisis and its implication. So uh, these are a couple of things which I, I, I uh, wanted to say, but also maybe this is my concluding points, point. I'm myself from Slovakia and we had a very uh, kind of uh, difficult beginning in our transformation processes, but really, uh, with the help, with the engagement of civil society and with addressing uh, those issues which also uh, Kazakhstan is addressing uh, through reform processes, Slovakia became one of the most prosperous and uh, developed countries uh, in the region. Of course, we are also facing many challenges. Now, the government 
is being uh, reconstituted uh, and, and, and so on. So democracy building is never ending process, but we want to share our experiences, but in the end, in the end, uh, the, the process of reforms, democracy building is in the hands of your people, uh, people of Kazakhstan. So I will stop yeah. here because I was speaking for too long, probably, and I would <laughs> yes. be very much uh, eager to, to listen to, to other speakers, how they see uh, our cooperation. Yeah, and we actually get a lot of questions we see in comments, uh, and I will a little bit switch also in Russian. Огромное спасибо всем, кто пишет вопросы. Пожалуйста, пишите их четко в комментарии. Также в комментарии написан адрес, куда вы можете выслать свои вопросы. Пожалуйста, пишите их, и мы обязательно озвучим uh, в части дискуссии. So now I would like to give the floor to already mentioned uh, distinguished guest, guest and one of the most prominent my defender from Kazakhstan, Evgeny Zhovtis, uh, director of Kazakhstan International Bureau for Human Rights and Rule of Law. Um, Evgeny, your organization has been one of victims of political persecution through the tax authorities over past few, few, few months. And uh, you are not alone. You, there was several kind of organization. Of course, uh, other human rights movement has even um, other problems like their members persecuted with criminal cases. But in your case specifically, uh, and some other NGOs, um, there was reaction from the EIS. Um, and Kazakhstan authorities stated uh, right after that, that the cases against your organization uh, persecuted through unjustified tax audits have been dropped due to insignificance. What is the status of the current, uh, I mean, what is the current status of uh, situation with the organization? Why do you think it was dropped? And uh, the second question is that the day after adoption of the resolution of European Parliament, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan uh, basically did a huge statement of disagreement with the criticize um, from the side of European Parliament uh, on human rights situation. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs noted that Kazakhstan is focused to release its human rights commitment step by step, it's quote, right? And the second step, uh, a second quote is that Tokayev began broad political reforms based on its uh, stated vision of listening state. What are Tokayev's reform as a part of listening state concept? And it is already months and a half after EP resolution was adopted. How justified were the member of European Parliament's criticism to the Kazakhstani authorities? Evgeny, floor is yours. Okay, thank you for having me and thank you European Parliament members to organize such uh, important hearings. And I think timely important. First of all, what relates to our organization, it was more than 20 organizations which were under the pressure since November last year. And uh, many times we argued all the sections of the authorities that it is what, not about the tax evasion or any taxes, it was about the discriminatory legislation which uh, forces all NGOs to submit uh, special reporting, uh, one big piece of reporting to the Minister of Information and uh, Social Development, uh, Public Development, which is uh, controlling NGOs because of the Committee on Civil Society inside this ministry. And the second piece of reporting is to the tax authorities about the foreign funding. And uh, I think that uh, the decision which was made, all these uh, charges which were dropped against our organizations in February, well, clearly the result of international pressure. It was not about any legal issues or rule of law. It was because of the statements of the EU, statements of the Transparency International, statements of the Civil Society Board of AITI. It was a number of uh, criticism of these decisions, and these uh, decisions were dropped uh, against all organizations. But we are still in courts because we disagree with the reasons how these uh, charges were dropped. We are still arguing some kind of position of the tax bodies. And secondly, the legislation is still in place, that it still could be used. The problem is that uh, if it could be used, it, sooner or later it could be used. That the question is how to withheld uh, this legislation, how to stop this discriminatory uh, let's, attitude towards NGOs and uh, civil society organizations, human rights organizations, because most prominent human rights organizations were the target of these efforts of the tax bodies. It was clearly politically motivated, but then again, politically politically dropped with, with the uh, pressure from outside. 
What about the uh, situation after the resolution? First of all, the problem is with this, uh, uh, let's say so, uh, statements made by Mr. Tokayev, is that any time we have to look at these statements and then to say, but. Yes, uh, something happens, but, but. Uh, I prepared a big, uh, re relatively comprehensive statement, which I will disseminate after this uh, panel uh, for everybody. It's in Russian and English. But I will point out uh, three or four important issues. Number one, the uh, statements which were made, they were about some political reforms and liberalization, like new law on freedom of assembly but the, or on peaceful assemblies. But the law which is adopted is not better than the previous one. We still have the notification procedure which looks like authorization. We still have authorization procedure for... Uh, demonstrations and uh, 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 again, uh, on demonstrations, there is still very few places where the people could uh, organize the peaceful assembly, which are not near the state buildings or uh, in the central squares. We are still uh, don't, uh, many people still do not uh, get the permission or their notification is not accepted. The people are still preventively arrested preventively detained and uh, got administrative arrests even if the uh, peaceful assembly itself was not held. This is the example. And uh, spontaneous assemblies are still prohibited. And many, many other issues which uh, made this law, which was declared as a uh, step, big step forward, which is not working. Secondly, libel was uh, decriminalized, but it was not decriminalized in reality. It was transferred. This article was transferred from the criminal code to the code administrative offenses. It is not in the civil legislation. The person who is uh, charged with the libel still face a big fine and uh, administrative arrest up to tw uh, two, two or three months, uh, to, to up to uh, th 30 days. Of course, it's much easier. It's not three years of imprisonment, but it's still the punishment made by the government. Thirdly, we have heard about, uh, already about this uh, reduce of the number of uh, members of political party to be registered. But it doesn't matter if it was 50,000, then 40,000, now it's 20,000. The opposition parties are still not registered. And they are still are not participating in the elections. And they are still are not, opposition is not present either in the parliament or in local legislatures. There is still no opposition in place. Thus, it's not working. But what makes me much more concerned and this my colleagues probably will say about that, and this my, prob uh, uh, to a certain extent, final uh, piece. It is about the political prosecutions of civil activists, peaceful civil activists, human rights defender, political opposition. There is a number of pressure. First of all, a number of cases are opened under the Article 174. It's the incitement of different types of discord. It's not hatred, it's discord. It's very vague definition in our law. Secondly, is the uh, uh, prosecution of the people uh, allegedly supporting these peaceful movements which are banned in Kazakhstan, Kosher Party AC and um, Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan. And, and uh, I'm a member of the Expert Council on Political Prisoners. Our list is growing every month. Before the, the, uh, the resolution of the European Parliament and after. And that will give you my final uh, example. Uh, besides, people are sentenced to imprisonment or to other forms of punishment not, and not imprisoned. All these people are considered extremists and all these people are included uh, in so-called list of people financing terrorism or extremism. Uh, this list is compiled by Ministry of Finance and every person who uh, allegedly committed uh, the extremist crime is included automatically in this list. It means that the person could not use any money, could not open business, could not even a lot of different problems arising out of this list. And the person will be in this list from three to six years. And secondly, uh, every person now, uh, the civic activist, which was um, sentenced for imprisonment or any type of punishment for alleged uh, incitement of uh, discord or participating in the banned organization, are banned of political of public activity nobody knows what does it mean but it means that people are 
prohibited from attending conferences and round tables. It's written in the in the sentence. They are prohibited from uh, participating in pe organizing peaceful assemblies. They are not could not participate or post something in the uh, social networks, and they could not even participate in public association in any kind. It's some kind of ban of polit of a range of political rights and civil freedoms. That's on one hand, the, yes, this uh, government is talking about the state which is hearing and which is more inclined to have dialogue. But on the other hand, anytime you have to say but, and a lot of these buts is, uh, is in my more comprehensive uh, statement. I will be ready to answer uh, any questions if they will actually uh, appear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evgeny. And uh, we now heard uh, testimonies of organizations which were persecuted by tax, uh, different kind of pressure, right? And now we actually move into human defender Anna Shokeva, uh, member of Human Rights uh, Movement 405, which actually, uh, unfortunately, persecuted with extremist charges. And she was, together with 14 other activists, uh, secretly sentenced uh, without right to appeal and without a right uh, to, uh, to be defended. Um, and uh, Anna, please tell me, um, at the same time, European uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, I'm just always referring because I want to give possibility to her different uh, point of views. So um, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan stated that the text of the resolution distorts the reality of the situation in Kazakhstan. And it was initiated by unfriendly minded politicians who get fabricated information from destructive circles. Your case and many other cases actually, unfortunately, uh, shows other um, part of the reality. And could you please tell us that the Kazakhstani authority uh, care about resolution recommendations and also try to add what already not was mentioned by Evgeny Jovtis, what kind of resolution of European Parliament recommendations have been implemented, if any? Anna, floor is yours. Да, здравствуйте. Спасибо большое за предоставленную возможность выступить по правам человека в Казахстане. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for possibility uh, to speak about human rights in Kazakhstan. Хочу отметить, что детальное описание нарушений прав человека в резолюции Европарламента оказало огромную поддержку для нашего общества. I would like to know that the detailed description of human rights violation in the European Parliament resolution greatly supported our society. Мы знаем, насколько серьезное было давление властей Казахстана на дипломатов Евросоюза и дипломатов Европарламента. We know how much pressure of Kazakhstan authorities put on the EU diplomats and members of European Parliament. Мы искренне рады, что режим не смог добиться цели, не смог удалить имена тех, кто ежедневно рискует ценой своей жизни и свободы за демократическое будущее Казахстана. And we're really glad that the regime didn't achieve its goal. It could not remove the names of those who defended the democratic future of Kazakhstan at cost of their lives and freedom every day. Особенно мы признательны за упоминание имен в резолюции пяти политически убитых активистов. And especially we're grateful for the names of five politically killed activists which were mentioned. Мы также рассчитываем, что обращение 820 граждан Казахстана с призывом расследовать незаконное давление на депутатов Европарламента будет проведено и результаты будут оглашены. And we also expect the appeal of 820 citizens of Kazakhstan to investigate illegal pressure on the members of European Parliament will be fulfilled and its results will be publicly announced. Если коротко говорить, что было сделано из рекомендаций резолюции, можно ответить, что ничего не было сделано. If we briefly summarize what has been done from the recommendation of the resolution of European Parliament, there is answer, nothing has been done. Но это не значит, что авторитарный режим не услышал призывов Европарламента. But it doesn't mean that authoritarian regime in Kazakhstan hasn't heard the call of the European Parliament. Режим очень хорошо услышал этот призыв и даже начал спасать свой имидж от возможных санкций. Режим heard it well and began to save its image from possible sanctions. 
Во-первых, режим ну, начал организовывать провластных блогеров, как внутри страны, так и за его пределами, чтобы пояснить якобы народу, что резолюцию Европарламента не обязательно исполнять, и режиму не страшны, не угрожают санкции. Firstly, pro-government bloggers within the country and outside of Kazakhstan are being organized and the way that authorities try to explain that the to the people that they do not have to implement the resolution's European Parliament recommendation and that personal sanctions from the EU and US don't scare them. And, second, the regime started giving an invitation to protest and even imitated the creation координационного совета псевдооппозиции, но есть такой момент, когда оппозиционное движение мирное, да, ДВК призывает своих сторонников поддержать этот митинг разрешенный, тут же власти Казахстана через санитарного врача сразу же запрещают проведение этого митинга. Secondly, selective permission for protest is given. And uh, Kazakhstani authorities even imitate the creation of the coordinating council of so-called opposition. But as soon as uh, we have situation, for example, um, and there is announcement of sanctioned rally and um, opposition movement, DCK, Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan, announce also that they will support it, uh, Kazakhstani authorities, uh, through the sanitary doctor, ban this rally. Почему они это делают, да, спросите вы? Они хотят ввести в заблуждение депутатов Европарламента и дипломатов ЕС. Поэтому такие встречи, как сейчас, для нас крайне важны. So why they do it, you will ask me. And uh, I would say that the authorities expect to be able to mislead members of European Parliament and EU diplomats. And that is why such hearing meetings with diplomats and members uh, are extremely important for us. Одновременно вместе с этим продолжается в стране фабрикация уголовных и административных дел. And at the same time, fabrication of political, criminal and administrative cases continues across the country. Первое. Угрожает физической расправой и уголовными делами активисту Кунбулату Байбулату, который выходит на протесты под консульством Китая в Алматы и хочет воссоединиться со своими родственниками, жертвами, да, узниками концентрационных лагерей Китая. So first, as example, threats to physical violence and criminal cases for those who protest in front of Chinese consulate in defense of ethnic Kazakhs, their relatives are victims of Chinese concentration camp. And the case of Kunbulat Baibulat is especially alarming. He is example what could happen. Uh, ему угрожают, что его убьют, как Дулата Агадил. So he is threatened um, that he can be killed like Дулата Агадил. Uh, и второе, продолжается фабрикация дел за публикации в социальных сетях и за протесты с требованием персональных санкций. And the second is that posts on social media and for giving out protests, going out uh, for protests, um, demanding personal sanctions and to release political prisoners, uh, also faced with uh, fabricating criminal cases uh, with uh, regard of uh, extremism. Это массовое нарушение рекомендации ООН, ОБСЕ и резолюции Европарламента. This is the most massive violation of the UN, the OEC and the EP recommendations. По состоянию на 25 марта 2021 года в Казахстане 105 уголовных дел, 29, ой, извиняюсь, 29 политических заключенных и 13 человек находятся под домашним арестом. So as of March, uh, to, uh, as of 25 March, uh, so until today, we have 105 politically criminal cases in Kazakhstan. Within them, 29 political prisoners and 13 people are under house arrest. Большинство преследуются за экстремистские статьи. And most of them are persecuted under so-called extremist article. Сразу после принятия резолюции были заведены еще четыре уголовных дела. Following the adoption of resolution, four criminal cases were opened. Из них это Жанибек Жунусов и Айдар Сыздыков, и они как раз таки находятся в СИЗО из-за требований персональных санкций в отношении главы КНБ 
MVD и прокуратури. And of these, uh, Jani Begjnusov and Aydar Sizdikov are under arrest for calling for personal sanctions. And uh, they called for personal sanctions against the head of National Security Committee, Minister of Interior um, and the prosecutor's office for massive human rights violations. Особенно критическая ситуация у активиста Абзала Каналиева, он находится в СИЗО, он инвалид третьей группы. У него было 13 операций на левой ноге, в результате чего пальцы на этой ноге были удалены, и несмотря на это его содержат в СИЗО, ему требуется срочная госпитализация. So the most crucial situation with activists from Akto Abzal Kanali, who can who can who who may lose uh, his leg, he needs urgent hospitalization, um, but he's unfortunately under uh, arrest for participating in, in protests. And uh, Abzal um, had 13 operations on his left foot, and he can lose his foot uh, because uh, um, you know of uh, development of gangrene. На сегодняшний день в Казахстане 105 политически мотивированных уголовных дел, из них 75 по экстремистским статьям. And as I said, uh, there is 105 political criminal cases in Kazakhstan, of which at least 75 under extremist articles. Как пример, 15 человек, включая меня, были тайно осуждены, без права на защиту и апелляцию, за якобы финансирование и пособничество экстремизму. And as example, 15, including me, have been uh, secretly sentenced uh, without uh, 15 activists uh, were sentenced secretly without right of uh, defense and appeal, allegedly for funding and aiding um, and abetting extremism. Каспий uh, банк, Халык банк, контролируемый родственниками Нурсултана Назарбаева вместе с КНБ и МВД фабрикуют против нас эти дела. So, and I want to underline that Kaspi and Halik Bank, uh, controlled by the relative of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, were involved in the nation with, together with National Security Committee and Minister of Interior in fabricating these cases. По сути, нас преследуют за сбор и получение гуманитарной помощи из публичных сборов и оплату политически мотивированных штрафов. So, what we are persecuted for is uh, for payment of politically motivated fines to the state from public fundraising and for collecting and receiving humanitarian aid. Uh, к сожалению, я сейчас не могу перечислить все имена, uh, но произносить их вслух, это значит их защитить. Uh, мы обязательно предоставим их в письменном виде, досье этих людей, uh, и... Мы рассчитываем, что дипломаты ЕС найдут возможность посетить политических заключенных в тюрьмах и встретиться с правозащитниками. Um, unfortunately, I cannot name all of those who are persecuted by name and at the same time mentioning their name in public. It means that to protect them. But we will certainly provide their profiles in writing to members of European Parliament and EU diplomats. And we expect that EU diplomats will find the opportunity to visit political prisoners and meet human rights defenders in Kazakhstan. Uh, so five out of 29 political prisoners are in Astana. В заключение я хочу отметить, что мы с особым вниманием и солидарностью наблюдаем за такими странами, как Россия и Беларусь. To sum up, we are watching with great attention and solidarity what is happening in Russia and Belarus. Также, как и эти народы, мы призываем правительство Европейского Союза вести персональные санкции в отношении тех, кто отдает масс незаконные приказы массово преследовать, пытать и убивать. And just the same, like people of uh, Russia and Belarus, we call on European governments to impose personal sanctions on those who order mass persecution, murder and torture. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anna. And now we go into uh, Bota Jardimali, lawyer and human rights defender, sister of former uh, Kazakhstani political prison, uh, prisoner uh, Iskander Yerimbetov. So, uh, Bota, uh, to sum up, it was a lot already said uh, by previous speakers. 
So we understand that international organizations such as OC, UN, uh, politicians in the EU and US, human rights defenders, they noted that Kazakhstan, is system, uh, Kazakhstan systematically ignores its international human rights obligation. So um, one of the main recommendations of the resolution of European Parliament is to consider application of the EU global human rights sanctions regime, which officials in Kazakhstan should be included uh, in the list of personal sanctions to stop mass repression in Kazakhstan. And there is a belief that sanctions against Kazakhstan's top officials who order human rights violations will make Kazakhstan's alliance with China and Russia stronger. Um, is it true? how it also uh, should be considered with the time frame. So would it be, um, is it, uh, is it uh, important that we will, have, uh, we will give more time for Kazakhstan authorities to fulfill recommendation of resolution of European Parliament or it's enough time was already done? What the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Luda. Uh, so everyone, thank, once again, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. And let me start with a little video to illustrate the point I would like to make. Uh, could you please run the video? A lot of properties. What are? What is about? <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Obviously, I am not advertising luxury real estate here. These properties in various Western countries have one thing in common. They belong to family members of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. And this is only a fraction of what they, what they actually own outside of Kazakhstan. And in Kazakhstan, they own the country. Uh, as already uh, has been mentioned, um, Nazarbayev built a corrupt, kleptocratic and authoritarian regime. Good news, Nazarbayev is no longer head of state. Bad news, there is no transition. Uh, in the existing system, Nazarbayev, together with his relatives and his close trusted associates, uh, has consolidated all economic and political powers. Even after his resignation, he de facto retains the ultimate power. And Nazarbayev's nominal successor, current head of state, Kasim Jumar Takayev, is continuing Nazarbayev's policy. And as uh, previous speakers already explained, uh, making the authoritarian, makes authoritarian regime, Nazarbayev's authoritarian regime, even stronger with increased political persecution. Takayev is not regarded as an independent political figure in Kazakhstan. Uh, so right now we don't have a transition. Now we have a power system in which a dictator enjoys full impunity and uh, is hidden behind a nominal head of state. Actually, reportedly, uh, Putin is considering adopting something similar. So right now, uh, Nazarbayev and his inner circle are the ultimate beneficiary of the corruption and uh, systematic human violations. They are ready to do anything, whatever it takes to stay in power. And uh, in the uh, latest resolution on Kazakhstan that has been mentioned already, uh, the European Parliament called on you to consider introduction of personal sanctions against human rights violators. And what we say in Kazakhstan, yes, please, please consider. And uh, Nazarbayev and his key associates, such as uh, already mentioned, uh, the head of political police, the KNB, Karim Masimov, the general prosecutor, Gaziz Nardualetov, and the Minister of Internal Affairs, uh, Iran Turgumbayev. They all should be your targets. Uh, you have probably noticed uh, in dealing with Kazakhstan that Kazakhstan is relatively sensitive when it is criticized by uh, the West about uh, its lack of democracy and systemic violation of human rights. And uh, 
this sensitivity comes from Nazar Baev's and his uh, associates' fear of Western sanctions. Uh, they keep their assets and their funds in the West. They don't want to lose what they have stolen from our country. They don't keep their assets and money in authoritarian countries like China and Russia because they don't trust Chinese or Russian financial or political system. But uh, despite this fear of sanctions, the existing regime um, has not made any significant step in order to achieve uh, the rule of law in Kazakhstan and comply with international human rights obligations. Instead, um, in dealing with the West, uh, Nazarbayev regimes continues to rely on propaganda, on superficial improvements that advertises major reforms, and uh, Evgeny Zhovtis explained today pretty well, and they also uh, rely on misinformation, disinformation, heavy lobbying, and even uh, weaponized corruption. And why they do so? Because they can. Because they haven't been any real personal consequences for human rights violators in Kazakhstan. Uh, the Kazakhstan regime thinks that uh, EU diplomats are gullible and naive uh, since they believe empty promises and false claim of Kazakhstan state officials. EU diplomats talk about values but ignore them when it comes to trade and investments. And it's been over 20 years of failed reforms and empty promises. Uh, so, it's time for action. It's time to make it clear to the authorities of Kazakhstan that they should stop pretending that they engage in dialogue and they must deliver. And it's not about the EU uh, taking uh, the moral high ground. It's about efficiency in getting results. And I would like uh, to finish my speech with a, a small example. Last year, uh, U.S. sanctioned an oligarch from Moldova, Vadimir Plakhatnik, and you know uh, his case pretty well. And he was the one who controlled all branches of power in Moldova. Uh, he was sanctioned because, and I quote, uh, his corrupt action undermined the rule of law and severely compromised the independence of democratic institutions in Moldova. After he had been sanctioned, Moldova had uh, presidential elections. In those elections, an opposition candidate could run and actually win. Kazakhstan has never had free and fair elections. And so I am uh, asking the EU, give Kazakhstan a chance to succeed. Impose sanctions on Nazarbayev and his cronies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boda. And I see we had like plenty of requests in our comments also with imposing sanctions, basically repeating your messages, but we will come up to them uh, later. And now I would like to give the floor to Rosalba Castelletti, a journalist from La Repubblica. Uh, Rosalba, you are um, those who basically close, closely followed and described events with human rights violations, persecution and opposition. Uh, in post-Soviet state, not only in Kazakhstan, but also Russia and Belarus, so you have really a huge field to compare. And um, in one of the um, interview of Lukashenko in autumn 2020, uh, he called uh, that Kazakhstani authorities that Kazakhstan has to learn from the mistakes of Belarus. And he advised the Kazakhstani authorities to take proactive approach against contagnation, referring to the peaceful protesters and to take advantage on the fact that Kazakhstan not in, uh, is under much uh, with international security as, as a Belarus. So is the Kazakhstani government following Lukashenko's advice, according to your observation? What is the role of international pressure on authoritarian corrupt uh, governments uh, play? And what you as a journalist learn uh, when you've been in Kazakhstan, when you met civil society, please share with us. Yeah, yes, perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you, Ludmila. First of all, I want, would like to say that I'm very pleased to join this discussion uh, along with uh, such great speakers. And I want to thank you, the MIP of Srivicius and the Open Dialogue Foundation for having organized this online event that has the merit to put the, the, to turn the spotlight on human rights abuses in Kazakhstan. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we talk a lot about Belarus, we talk a lot about the repression in Russia, but uh, we don't know, we don't hear so much about Kazakhstan in the West. And the problem is uh, that uh, we know the country just for uh, the old Silk Road, for uh, the Baikonur uh, space station, recently for the movie uh, Borat. In Italy, <laughs> as it we had uh, uh, a diplomatic uh, incident in 2013 when uh, the wife of the opposition uh, leader Abliazov and their daughter were uh, arrested in Rome and deported to Kazakhstan. But in general, uh, outsiders barely know where Kazakhstan is uh, or who the people are. And this is a problem. The former president uh, Nazarbayev made a lot of efforts uh, during his presidency to improve the international recognition of the country. And uh, as uh, it was mentioned in the recent years, the country has been the site of a lot of international uh, events, from uh, international football gathering uh, to uh, religious leaders meeting uh, uh, to Syrian peace talks. Uh, and back in 2017, when I was the Moscow correspondent for my Italian newspaper La Repubblica, I was uh, invited to join a press tour to Kazakhstan to visit the, uh, the first expo ever held in a post-Soviet state. And I should say that my colleagues uh, and I were uh, very much impressed by the uh, monumental landmarks by very well-known uh, architects like uh, uh, Kisho Kurokawa and Norman Foster that uh, um, are uh, in the new capital uh, Astana, now called uh, Nur Sultan, uh, in honor of the former president uh, Nazarbayev. And uh, this is how propaganda works. Uh, Kazakh government uh, has spent uh, millions, uh, billions on these events, uh, and the millions uh, were stolen by corruption. And this happens in a country where uh, uh, barely half of the population lives uh, uh, on about. Uh, $20 a month. Uh, Kazakhstan is trying to appear a modern country, a modern economy, but uh, is still not respecting the basic rights. Uh, uh, behind the facade, the corruption is widespread. Uh, the press uh, and the opposition are silenced. Uh, it was mentioned many times uh, by the former speakers. Um, and last January, uh, the parliamentary election uh, were held. Uh, uh, it was the first vote uh, after uh, the former president Nazarbayev uh, resigned uh, and passed the power to Takayev. The new president promised political reforms, but uh, as uh, it was said, uh, nothing is really changed. According to the international abroad servers, uh, the elections were neither free nor fair. There was no competition. Uh, the fundamental uh, freedom rights were not uh, respected. The only opposition party registered decided to boycott the event in order to protest this lack of, uh, of freedom. And nonetheless, some MIP joined uh, the vote to observe the election. And I think that in this way, they. Uh, give a sort of international recognition to the vote, even if it was not fair. Uh, as a journalist, uh, I think that uh, uh, the press mission is to give voice uh, to the people that don't have voice. Uh, and uh, before the election, I had the chance uh, to interview one of uh, uh, six brave women uh, who shake their heads uh, in order to protest uh, against uh, the repression uh, in the country. Uh, I was very compelled when in uh, a video posted online, they say, we live in a prison called Kazakhstan. Uh, these women, Rakilia Beknazarova, was briefly detained uh, in the, on the day of the election. Uh, one of the other, Nurgul Kaluava, is still in jail. I was asked to mention uh, during this event uh, the case of other women uh, that uh, were sentenced uh, to 
uh, the, the, to freedom limitation according to the famous uh, article 405 as Zazira Kambarova, Nazira Lezova and Nazira Lepesova. But uh, as you recalled, uh, there are uh, a lot more than 100 criminal charged people in Kazakhstan. There are uh, 29 political prisoners. There were five political murders. And I think that European Union is making a lot of efforts in order to denounce uh, these uh, human rights violations. As you recalled, uh, on February, you voted uh, a resolution of human rights in the country, but um, maybe it's not enough. Uh, it, there is um, uh, the EU global human rights uh, sanction regime that uh, can give the possibility to target uh, individuals and entities involved in the, these uh, human rights abuses. Uh, you mentioned uh, Belarus and Russia. Uh, after the political repression in these two countries, and I uh, was a testimony of both of the situation, uh, people were sanctioned. Uh, the same is happening in Kazakhstan, and I think that it's fair to expect uh, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, regime. Uh, the EU is the biggest uh, trade partner of Kazakhstan and uh, signed uh, this uh, enhanced partnership and cooperation agreement with uh, the Kazakh government. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, my appeal is uh, do not fall in the trap of the propaganda. The, the Europe, uh, I'm sure, can make its voice heard. It, it has all the means to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your statements and your testimonies for us and for members of European Parliament, for those who actually uh, you know, a lot of citizens of Kazakhstan, they read your article and uh, shared with the political prisoners. Uh, I mean, it was, I think, uh, delivered to everyone by, by lawyers with a also risk for their life, but they try to, to, to show that at least someone take care and, and someone lights uh, and on, their, on their stories and on political persecution. And now I would like to give uh, the floor uh, to Dr. Luca. Uh, Anceschi, a senior lecturer in Central uh, Asian Studies uh, at the University of Glasgow. And you are closely following the situation in the region in general. And you also work in monitoring implementation of the PCA uh, between the EU and Kazakhstan. Now you work on drafting recommendation to European Parliament on EU Turkmenistan PCA. How important are European Parliament's resolution on human rights as a tool to monitor implementation of the PCA obligation between this or that state um, uh, which signed agreement or is going to sign agreement with uh, uh, you? And in one of your publications, you mentioned that the pragmatic interest of Kazakhstan and the European Union have greatly influenced by the relationship between them. And as a result, prevented the creation of successful cooperation in the human dimension. What does it mean in practice? What are the weaknesses of the EU policies in the countries of Central Asia and how they can be fixed according to your uh, monitoring? Well, I think that uh, in, in 2020-2021, we got to a particularly important watershed in both the evolution of politics in Kazakhstan and also in the evolution of the policy that the EU implemented vis-a-vis -vis Kazakhstan. And the trajectories are quite intersecting because we have a constant, inexorable decline of governance standard in Kazakhstan since 2011. The long goodbye on Nazarbayev brought with it a way of repression, a way of violation. Uh, the transition didn't really work in terms of improving the, the quality of the governance. But on the other hand, we've seen the European Union becoming more and more active, more and more visible, more and more important when it comes to Kazakhstan, specifically as Central Asia more widely. And when uh, I think the EU is the biggest donor in Central Asia, or beyond being the biggest, the biggest trade partner. In that sense, when you become so such an important uh, player, values, especially because we're talking about the EU and not China, values are probably more important than how much you trade and how much you buy. So in uh, my argument, which follows up from the research that you mentioned before, Ludmila, is that uh, we need to see um, a more uh, 
a more specific, a more powerful way of the EU to help the government of the region in Kazakhstan, more in particular, in develop, in actually implementing what they promised they would do. We've seen uh, in the lead up to the OSC chairmanship of Kazakhstan, and then eventually in the lead up to the expanded PCA, that Kazakhstan made some commitments about the ways in which they would adjust to the kind of standard that the people of the European Union were asking them to do. But what we haven't seen is uh, the EU making sure that these promises were to be kept by Kazakhstan. And I think this is a structural problem here. The fact is that we're talking of a country which is not part of any kind of accession or membership uh, dimension for the European Union, which is a problem in terms of uh, conditionality. The, the, the carrot and the stick, the, the carrot it's, it's much less important than the stick. So in that sense, it doesn't really work for Kazakhstan. But we also see, and, um, and this obviously varies across the institution, with the parliament being on the one end and the commission and perhaps external service on the other, we've seen a different attitude to, uh, to the kind of standards that Kazakhstan should, should uphold when it comes to um, its good government problems. I think that the revolution of February, uh, it is a very important step because it really captures the intersecting point I was mentioning before, because it goes, uh, it goes beyond what every other prior document, including the PCA really, have, have gone. It names names, it names issues, and it names uh, solution. You should do this, this, and that. So it is a particularly important document, and the, the parliament should be commended. The problem is that uh, I think that when it comes to Central Asia, but Kazakhstan in particular, and I think that Kazakhstan is different from the other because he has uh, attached a greater importance than the Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan to EU relations in the past. So Kazakhstan has got a much more advanced portfolio of ties to, 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 to feature. And so to me, when it comes to Kazakhstan, uh, I think that action now needs to be speaking more louder than words. We need these commitments to be followed. And uh, I would suggest that beyond what, whatever um, uh, suggestion that been made before, especially by, by Boto, I would say that uh, I would like to see, especially when it comes to the implementation of, of this resolution, a fully functioning monitoring mechanism. Uh, a mechanism that it does implement what it sets out to do. It does it in an open, transparent, and fair way, without asking for too much, but following up on what the EU has asked Kazakhstan to do. The implementation of this mechanism should have, if the regulation allow, should let the participation of activists, local politicians, but also or external people, people like me or Rosalba, people who have an expertise in the country and that actually could participate and suggest the way to make sure. And also it should be something that uh, is done in a consistent way. It doesn't rely on occasional human rights ladder. It's not, whole, it's not held on closed door, but we have the opportunity to hear what, what's going on. And actually set benchmarks that are clear and uh, evident for everyone to see. Once you set those benchmark, and we, we, we say Kazakhstan is going to, and say we want free and fair election, it doesn't mean anything. We need to get there. You need to set up a, a pathway to liberalization, a pathway to pluralism, a pathway. Now, this is a country that never had a free and fair election. And now, and so it, it is, it's got no standard when it comes to electoral practice. We've seen it in the 90s, we see it in the, 20, in the 2010s, and we see it now as well. So I would say that it is important that the European Union as a whole, as a multi-institutional framework, but particularly with the help of the parliament, which in my experiment on the Turkmenistan file is doing a, an excellent job in pushing the problem local governance to, to, to have to be enhanced. I think that you should pay attention to um, making sure that we don't have, and this is my final point, we don't have this resolution as another missed opportunity in the EU-Kazakhstan dialogue. 
uh, there was a policy by the Kazakhstani government in the 1990s that was called the Path to Europe, transforming Kazakhstan into an European society. That has completely disappeared. Maybe the slogan is there, but the reality is that we've seen the regression of Kazakhstan to a situation of complete authoritarianism, increasing isolation, and this is not something which is occasional, you know, like a corona power graph, no. It is something that we've seen systematically implemented since 2011, and that defined the very last decade of the Nazarbayev era, and of course, even the post democratic transition. So I thank you everyone for their attention, also mm, the ODF and the European Parliament for the invitation, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, thank you so much. We have a lot of questions, but most of them are repeating and uh, they basically call for personal sanctions or uh, asking if uh, members of European Parliament and uh, Peter, uh, Ambassador Burian also aware about political persecution and number of political prisoners in the country and what should be done in this regard. Is going to be implemented personal sanctions or what kind of other actions basically uh, a plan to be used in order to stop this total impunity and uh, uh, violation of uh, international recommendation by Kazakhstan. So I just briefly sum up and then I, there is also some kind of testimonies uh, which we also can read and share, but maybe uh, Ambassador Burian or, or Peter, um, uh, Peter Ostrovich uh, we would like to, to answer. Yeah, uh, if I may uh, yeah, briefly of course. react. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I was listening with a great interest uh, to your comments, to your information. And uh, actually, I, I wanted to also react to something which uh, some people uh, mentioned in the discussion, that we are na naive and we cannot uh, distinguish be between propaganda and real situation uh, on the ground. No, we we can uh, uh, be uh, uh, assured that uh, that we can, uh, and uh, actually the communication like we have today and uh, uh, regular communication with civil society, with the human rights, activists uh, actually helped us really to go into details uh, in our understanding of real problems. So this is one thing. Uh, second, which I wanted to highlight, uh, we uh, strongly believe in uh, uh, cooperation, in dialogue, in addressing issues. And uh, we really uh, want, to, want to use this uh, space, which is also in our relationship potentially better and, and, and so on. But, what is really very important, um, we actually need to be realistic. Uh, how much we can do, uh, how, how much uh, we can use our influence, because we are not alone uh, in the region, and there are many other players with different values, different approaches, and, and, and so on. But once again, it doesn't mean that we do not want to engage on, on this. Uh, on the contrary, we want to uh, use our programs and uh, show benefits of the imp uh, implementation of human rights um, and uh, all uh, international com commitment, not as Western values or uh, something EU actually invented, but really as universal values. And we sh want to show it on a practical uh, influence and benefit also for economic situation and many other things. So these are things which will be uh, also pursuing. And on sanctions, Maybe uh, also very briefly, uh, once again, I wanted to uh, highlight that protection of human rights is a cornerstone and priority of EU's external action. That is why uh, the European Union, uh, European Council decided on uh, September, on December 7, uh, to approve the global uh, human rights sanctions regime, allowing to target individuals, entities, and bodies responsible for or involved in serious human rights violation and abuses worldwide. And these are genocide, crimes against humanity, extrajudicial killings, and many other things, and abuses which are systematic and widespread. Imposing sanctions is, in my view, the last resort. It's a serious matter, and uh, the EU is not throwing the sanctions here and there, but uses this tool only when other means and measures are um, uh, exhausted, including diplomatic efforts. And uh, also, it's very important to say that uh, it's in the hands of uh, EU member states to take this decision. But with Kazakhstan, first of all, we want to strengthen our partnership and we also want to behave as partners when we see that something is happening which is not in line with international commitments and standards. Um, 
uh, we want to offer our help and cooperation for addressing those problems. And the same we also expect from Kazakhstan when our partners see something in our practice which doesn't fit with our commitments. And we are not pretending to be ideal. You see how many problems we have also in this area. So only through dialogue and cooperation of equals, we believe we can we can uh, achieve uh, uh, progress and, and, and so on. So this is what I wanted to uh, contribute to the discussion. And once again, I uh, very much appreciate your comments and uh, also suggestions, but um, I think really um, we need to be careful of where we uh, are uh, uh, going and what we want to achieve by, let's say, pushing sanctions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Peter, or maybe we would give the floor for civil society of Kazakhstan so they also react uh, for uh, words of how, how you feel? Ludmila, very shortly, my, my reaction yeah. on your very precise questions. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for a real flow of uh, very concrete and uh, sometimes very pressing, uh, and I have to admit, uh, uneasy questions, uh, especially what comes to exact names, uh, uh, situations, and so on and so forth. But I, uh, I noticed, for example, even the installment of surveillance cameras um, in front of the houses of activists once uh, they show some activities. To my mind, it's, it's a violation of uh, personal uh, uh, data and uh, I mean it should be proved from authorities why the person should be observed uh, in such a you know extreme way. But um, indeed, I mean the European Union has the EU global, uh, uh, um, global human rights sanction, sanctions regime. And I would agree with the ambassador that it's a it's a final step or final resort uh, in in terms of uh, fighting and advancing human rights worldwide. It's a new sanctions regime, relatively new sanctions regime from the last year. But what what is missing in the sanction regime, and I'm very strong advocate for improving, putting uh, this crime on uh, uh, on surveillance, it's corruption. I have to admit that state-run, state-supported corruption is something which ruins whole countries, whole societies. And it's not just a crime committed by Putin. I have to admit, there are many, many energy and resources-rich countries, and sometimes not very rich, where elites simply robbing their people. And that's why we sometimes have uh, such a series of... Uh, uh, pictures like uh, Bota showed us in a short uh, inter uh, video in, in Western Europe. It's a shame for Western Europe, which gladly accepts money uh, in cash or whatever, allows those people to flourish, not asking them where money comes from. And my message, I mean, to all those countries and even municipalities and governments, the day will come when people of those countries, which are robbed, will come and ask, give us back. And they will be completely right. I am very much in favor of putting cry, uh, uh, corruption as a crime to be prosecuted by EU global human rights sanctions mechanism. Thank you very much, Petrus. And now I would like to give the floor also Luca Bota. Um, uh, Rosalpa, uh, Evgeny, uh, Anna. So think, please, if you have comments. Um, because Ambassador Burian also mentioned something important, that Kazakhstan can be basically moved in the side of Russia, for example, allies, like, I, I would be more precise, neighbor countries like uh, Russia and China. And just yesterday, uh, Facebook uh, announced once again that there was, for example, joint cooperation between some states with uh, Chinese hackers to persecute Uyghurs abroad. And actually in Kazakhstan, we have this case of Baibalat Kunbalat, who, whose account was hacked just because he was protesting in front of uh, Chinese embassy. So it's happening right now. But what about me? Maybe you can be more precise. How basically sanctions will affect with these uh, um, international relations? Because is it too early or is it too late to use the sanctions? And when is the appropriate time, according to the civil society opinion? Uh, switch on your microphone, please. Microphone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Luda, I, I would like to give the uh, floor to Evgeny Alexandrovich first, because he's been raving, you haven't noticed. Ah, okay, sorry, I, I haven't seen it. Okay, yeah. because, okay, sorry. Yes, Evgeny, please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I have uh, three brief comments uh, and 
probably some suggestion. First of all, I think that when we are talking about corruption in Kazakhstan and some other countries in the region, we should not talk only about financial corruption, about bribes and so on. We have to talk about political corruption. And this is much more uh, difficult because uh, you could fight with the uh, corruption when you are trying to let's uh, to separate the businessman and the official. But if you have the official and the businessman in one place and the, the one person, it's very difficult to fight the corruption. That the key point with the elections, with all other things, is political corruption. And the poli problem of political corruption is very serious. It's number one. Number two, this my second point is about the. Uh, uh, dialogue and so on. I agree that dialogue is needed. I agree that dialogue is not uh, what we could avoid. But the problem is what the result of the dialogue and what happens if you have the number of political prisoners growing, if you have a number of persecutions growing, you have to think what dialogue is uh, for the sake of dialogue, what it is bringing this dialogue, how to make the things to work better. And my third uh, comment, uh, which is to a certain extent is uh, uh, coming out of the previous one, the, the uh, human rights, what, what our authorities understand very well, first of all, uh, we are trapped between Russia and China, that yes, of course, to a certain extent, probably if there will be more pressure, they will move slightly in that direction. But Kazakhstan uh, have to be sovereign, it have to be independent, and he could not avoid to bring the West to counterbalance Russia and China. Otherwise, uh, the pressure will be much more uh, stronger. That's, uh, there are certain leverages still. But what is important in my final point is that what could be sent as a message that human rights, especially development of civil society, rule of law and democracy are not only humanitarian values, they are economical issues. And when our authorities saw this statement from the Transparency International or from the EATI or from other organizations which are not political, which are not uh, dealing with the human rights issues, but which send the right messages that the violation of the civil society rights and the, the shrinking space for it will undermine the standards which you want to achieve, undermine your aspirations to become the members of OECD and so on, it's a very good message. Yes, of course, they are not caring too much sometimes about humanitarian um, uh, measurement of the human rights and values, but economical uh, ties, economical perspectives, investment, climate, and so on is working. That I think that dialogue is needed, but it should be a combination of different uh, strategies, including at certain point sanctions as well. Look about Jean uh, Ozenion and Dijan. These two things have to be addressed properly. Thank you. Thank you. So, Bora? Uh, I, I just, yeah, I just have a quick comment and um, to what Ambassador Burian said. I, I do consider that uh, personal sanctions should be the last resort. Uh, strategically, strategic imposition of personal sanctions they, it will actually create a serious incentive for the regime to finally comply with its international obligations. And it will weaken the regime in general. And it will be a very strong message sent by the European Union, a uh, message of support to our civil society. It will definitely create better grounds for real, genuine reform, not just talks, another dialogue, another empty talk. And uh, what is important for us as a representative of the civil society, sanctions will weaken the targets themselves because you know, they, they're going to lose their uh, credibility, they're going to lose their um, uh, uh, support of uh, their allies, both internationally and uh, internally within the country. And uh, this is very important, because when you are talking about Kazakhstan, you always assume that you are negotiating, you have a country on the other hand. Actually, what you have on the other hand, uh, on, on, on the other side, it's an organized criminal group that captured our state and been running our state for 30 years. And uh, we have to start questioning their leg legitimacy. Nazarbayev uh, self-proclaimed uh, uh, like that he's the leader of the nation. We don't consider him the leader of our nation. And that's why it's very important that uh, he's... Um, 
his legacy should be questioned, his, uh, uh, his current stance should be questioned. And uh, in, in this sense, sanction would do only great things to the country. It actually will open the door, will bring some fresh air to the country. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Buda. Luca uh, and uh, Rosalpa, maybe short mm -hmm. comments from your side. Is sanctions should be just like when is genocide happened? Should we wait, for example, until genocide to apply for personal sanctions? Or should we, uh, we use uh, the message that it should change behavior? Like it was, for example, in case of Moldova, no one waited until genocide, but applied it to give possibility for civil society somehow develop and uh, opposition to, to, to really force uh, reforms. Rosalba, I go first if you don't mind. Um, I think the, the, the sanction, it, it's a very big word with, and also a measure with significant implications. So there has to be a trajectory in which you uh, impose sanction upon a country. You can't sign up an EPCA one year and the year after you have a sanction without any anything uh, major happening. I mean, I know that there is some, but we haven't had the board like Belarus in Kazakhstan. So. I think that this is, but I think it's also kind of reductive to speak just about that. I think that we need, we need to, as I was saying before, a pathway to get to the point in which the Central Asian states and Kazakhstan in particular are actually put in the condition on having to do what they promised to do in order to keep their ties with the EU. These ties can be commercially important, uh, energy important, or can even be just um, image make point, as Kazakhstan always did. We parted with the EU, so we advanced. But I think that uh, there is more attention needed on making sure that the instrument that they have are actually used, rather than saying, we should do this, and no focus on what we have. I think that the resolution, it's, it's something fundamentally important, because it's not an easy read for people in North Sultan. The Kazakhstani regime does not come out very, very light, lightly about that. It, it, it's a pretty condemning document. So I think if the European Union, the institutions, the parliament, the external service, the commission are actually saying to the Kazakh, well, this is what we say you want to do if you want to keep dealing with us, you will make it work. I think that it's an important step, actually a landmark in the work that the people of the EU institutions are doing in Kazakhstan. Okay, Rosalba? Yeah, I agree with Luca. I mean, uh, it's important to sign this uh, kind of partnership. Uh, international trade is important, uh, but uh, you have to also be sure that uh, this partnership uh, is enhanced. If uh, uh, the partnership mentioned uh, the, uh, um, the importance uh, of uh, human rights uh, and uh, freedoms in the country, so you have to make, be sure that uh, uh, these uh, liberties, uh, these freedoms uh, are uh, recognized to the people. As I mentioned before, uh, international recognition is very important for the Kazakhstan uh, government. Uh, and uh, the resolution was a, mes a message, as uh, Luca mentioned, and uh, sanction will be another uh, political means to uh, make this uh, a message effective uh, and uh, i want just to specify that my allusion to propaganda was uh, to my colleagues because i read a lot of uh, questions uh, of uh, people asking uh, why international media uh, don't speak about uh, kazakhstan but they cover the belarus protests or the russia protests i think that one of the problem is that propaganda works uh, and uh, the international event i mentioned worked uh, in that uh, uh, in that way, and uh, uh, the political pressures that worked. So my allusion to propaganda was for my colleagues, just to specify. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalba. Petras, so um, we almost out of time. So maybe I will give the possibility for you to make a close remark, because it's kind of very emotional from one side discussion. Uh, we see that there are different opinions. Uh, it should be continued discussions should be continued monitor, uh, monitoring. So um, what would you uh, say as sum up? Uh, I mean, we, we have like plenty of questions which we even cannot read at the moment, but I think we will find somehow a way, um, maybe, I don't know, next hearing or with cooperation with other members of European Parliament, uh, how to address them. 
Well, I have to admit that our resolution was not an accidental, you know, event. So we we spotted uh, the situation uh, increasingly worrisome in in Kazakhstan. It's not an accidental resolution. And Luca and men, many of you mentioned very rightly, and Ambassador as well, uh, as implementation is important, and especially monitoring parts of this process. As long as we are serious in assisting uh, Kazakh society to develop uh, towards open and democratic society, we have to remain engaged, and not only by resolutions, but by the actions afterwards. So that's why um, I, I give you my word that uh, I will follow this uh, issue and situation in Kazakhstan, although I am really very much busy with uh, Belarus as a rapporteur, yeah. not to speak about Ukraine and Eastern Partnership and other countries, but I will spend uh, a certain part of my business time on Kazakhstan as well. I don't know, for good or bad, for some people it might be for bad, Please. but I hope for democracy, generally speaking, it will be a, a certain contribution. So implementation monitoring should remain, indeed. There was a question about the support for human rights uh, and civil uh, civic activists. Um, colleagues, uh, uh, the European uh, delegation should, uh, should know very well. I mean, there are good grounds uh, and grants from the European Co Commission in this regard. Again, uh, I, uh, I call on you, there is a, in, in organizations like Endowment for Democracy, Endowment for Democracy. Here is the uh, the annual report of this organization. It's really able to support uh, those um, uh, people and activists. And I'll do my best to pay an attention to those people in charge that it, it might be a demand from the uh, Kazakh uh, side as well. But thank you very much for your recognition. So sometimes we issue um, reports or resolutions and uh, we don't know. Did we hit the target or, or no? But I think in this time, on the 11th of uh, February, we did hit the target. And believe me, we will uh, stay in touch with you, in close cooperation with you. You are great people. I mean, we, I received a very lot, uh, lot of good arguments and very precise practical information. So uh, I think we, if we speak about our partnership, it should be a partnership indeed. And partners should be able to speak freely, present arguments, and ask for the better. Because I don't think that uh, in terms of uh, development, we should be worried about only uh, economic development in Kazakhstan. Social justice, political justice is the same important. And here I, I stand and I give you my commitment uh, once again that uh, I will follow the information uh, what we spoke about today in coming uh, days, weeks, months, and years, uh, as, as long as I am in the European Parliament, and probably more. Thank you, Ludmila. Thank you, thank all you. the speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Really appreciate.